I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to Professor Doug Tallamy, author of amongst other things, the internationally influential wildlife gardening books, Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope. It was reading Bringing Nature Home that caused me to realise the urgency with which we must make changes to the way we garden, and that inspired me to pin my colours to the master of wildlife gardening once and for all. I'm absolutely delighted to have him as guest on the show, and this episode feels like a crowning moment for all the amazing guests that have gone before and for the research that I've personally undertaken in the pursuit of producing the podcast. I hope you enjoy listening to the interview as much as I did recording it. The first question that I wanted to ask you, and I don't want to dwell on this because it is something that I've speak, spoken to previous guests about. Um, and again, I think you've addressed it quite extensively in, in many of your books. But is it incorrect to think that nature is somewhere else and that it's outside our garden fences? And if so, why is that? Well, that is, that's the condition we have created. So if we consider ourselves to be separate from nature and we, we only we, we confine nature to um, little parks and preserves, there, there are two reasons that's not going to work. First of all, we need natural, we need functional ecosystems everywhere to produce the ecosystem services that support humans, not just in a few little parks and preserves. Nature is not just for our entertainment, someplace we go visit. We need it. We need it everywhere. So confining it outside of the places where humans live and work and play is uh, that's ultimately uh, a huge mistake. Uh, And it has led to what we see in the news. Insect apocalypse is here. You know, in North America, we've lost three billion birds. The U.N. says we're going to lose a million species. None of those things are, are options in the long run. Yet that's where we are because of the way we landscape, because we create dead zones where humans live and expect nature to be happy someplace else. So that's in the long run, that's not going to work. And what we need to do is find ways for humans and nature to coexist. I thought it was interesting, the concept of carrying capacity that you talk about in your book. Can you give an overview of what that is and why it's important to humans? Well, um, every ecosystem, every place, the planet as a whole, Um, has the ability to support a certain amount of life. So the definition of carrying capacity is the ability of a particular place to support a population of uh, any particular species in a sustainable way. So uh, the population can reach the carrying capacity and stay there or oscillate around it um, as long as it doesn't exceed the carrying capacity and degrade the resources that support it. Any population that exceeds its carrying capacity, where there are too many individuals for that environment to support, uh, is going to ultimately degrade the carrying capacity, and then there will be fewer individuals that 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 place can support. The big part of that carrying capacity that that, um, even even ecological texts tend to ignore is that when one species exceeds the carrying capacity, it degrades local resources, but it degrades it not just for that species, but for every other species that needs those resources. So the biggest species that have exceeded its, its carrying capacity right now is humans, which means we have taken resources from, from everything else. And this is why we're in the sixth grade extinction. Everything is going towards supporting burgeoning human populations uh, unsustainably because there are now more humans on the planet than the planet can sustain at the life the lifestyle that we all want um, and everything else is suffering because of it. Rather than trying to figure out how many humans we can cram onto the planet before everything collapses totally, we should be trying to figure out how many humans we can sustain on this planet without anything collapsing. Cause that's the only thing that truly is sustainable in the future. Mm. I like your book um nature's best hope because you actually give practical advice in it but one of the things that struck me when i was reading it is 
You talk about hooded warblers and the fact that they won't set up a breeding territory unless there are other breeding pairs in the area, even if all the other conditions seem perfect. And to me, that seems to illustrate how little we know about the nuances of the life cycles of other species and that we can't assume that we know what they want or need. So is this going to be problematic if we do want to implement guidelines or ecological best practice moving forward? Well, lack of knowledge of, of the species we're trying to conserve is, is certainly an impediment. And the hooded warbler is a great example. When you really get to know the species, uh, you find out they need more than just space and resources. They need a social context, too. And apparently this is true for um, martens uh, and probably a number of birds. And it's probably true for a number of mammals as, as well. Probably less true for invertebrates. Um, They're simply less social to begin with. But, um, yeah, our knowledge of the natural world is really pretty scanty. And yet here we are trying to manipulate it and and, uh, either for for good or for bad. Uh, And we have a lot to learn. So the more more we learn, the better. Um, This is a growing problem because... Most of us now are more separated from nature than ever. We don't eat, we, our, our ecological IQ on a scale of one to 10 is about a one. Um, yet we're pretending we're going to, to go out and, and make things better. So um, we need to study. We need to educate um, well beyond the, the basics of where we are. Mm. And do you feel like citizen scientists and gardeners have a role to play in that? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the other things that struck me, and it is a question that I've had when I've been reading sort of books that are carrying a similar message to yours, is that if we lose species that have evolved as specialist feeders, won't that ecological niche be filled by a similar amount of individuals overall, but just from a reduced number of species, so they are the generalists? Um and is that a right. problem? Because isn't it survival of the fittest after all? <laughs> um, okay, two things there. First of all, that that is uh, that's a great hypothesis. That if you lose your specialists, the generalists will fill in. Uh, you know, most of the specialists we're talking about here are, are insects that have specialized relationships with plants. And the reason they're they're so important is that they are supplying the the energy, the food that drives our food webs. So losing these insects is not an option. It's not just that I like to talk about insects. They're, they're critical in, in the support of the rest of, of, of uh, the species in an ecosystem. So if you trade specialists for generalists, everything should be okay because there's just as many insects. That's the hypothesis. Well, we, we actually looked at that. We've looked at that in a couple of different experiments. Uh, and it turns out that our generalists aren't nearly as generalized as we think they are. Uh, and they do not compensate. And none of our experiments have shown that they compensate for the loss of, of specialists. There are, the, the loss of generalists is less than the loss of specialists, but it's not nearly enough to compensate in terms of diversity or abundance or the amount of biomass that's available uh, for other, other animals to eat. Um, we're looking now at, at the definitions of specialists and generalists. You know, some people think, that it's a continuum, and at one end of the continuum, you've got generalists that can eat anything, and at the other end, you've got specialists that can only eat one thing. That's actually not the way it is. 90% of the insects are highly specialized, where they can only eat one or two plant lineages. Rather than looking at the number of plant lineages that an insect can eat, let's look at the number of plant lineages that they cannot eat. And when you do that, even our very most special uh, generalist insects, uh, and and if in this country, that would be things like the white mark tussock moth or the io moth or one of the boars. They can eat over 100 genera of plants. And that sounds very, very specialized. But when you look at the number of plants that are available to them, uh, there's about 96% of the plants out there that they cannot eat. So even the most generalized insects are highly specialized when you look at the the you know, the uh, array of plants that they could eat because they're available to them, but they don't. Um, so that's the problem by thinking that, that, that uh, generalists are going to compensate. Um, there's no study that shows that they actually do, uh, and, and that's why we can't rely on them. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and you talked about adaptation. Mm. 
Um, you know, survival of the fittest. Well, uh, yes. And in the long run, that is, is going to work its way out. But humans are changing, uh, changing everything about our environment so rapidly. It's those changes are exceeding the ability of, of, uh, adaptation to keep up. So for example, um, you know, in Europe, you have the, the common reed Phragmites australis, and, and we brought the European genotype over to this country almost 400 years ago. It was packing material in the earliest ships. Uh, and it has been here as an invasive species for almost 400 years. Well, in Europe, uh, it supports 170 species of insects. So it's a good native, it's a functional part of the ecosystem. After 400 years of being in this country, it only supports five. So adaptation is happening, but far slower than the rate of change that we humans are, are uh, delivering to the environment. In the meantime, Phragmites australis has, has you know, taken over the marshes, made them monocultures. They used to be diverse ecosystems with lots of plants. Now it's a monoculture of one plant that can only support five insects. Um, and, and that's why. So in, in 10,000, 100,000 years, will, will things work themselves out? Probably. But uh, and that's what evolution does. That's what adaptation does over time. But you know, those are evolutionary time scales, not ecological time scales. Uh, and and we are ruining things on ecological time scales and expecting evolution to keep up. It can't do it. So and then, again, that's why we have the the sixth great extinction. We're just changing things way too fast for anything to adapt to. Mm-hmm. Um, and talking about host species, I know that you did spend an entire book put, putting forward the case for native plants, and it isn't possible to sum up that case here. But if you could choose maybe one or two of the most compelling reasons to illustrate the case for natives over um, invasive plants or non-native plants in gardens, what would they be? Uh, well, I, I do have to develop that here because that is the main main reason, the fact that the kingpins of our food webs, the insect herbivores, are by and large unable to eat those plants. They're by, they, they are unable to develop and reproduce on those plants. Um, and that's because plants protect themselves from insects primarily with phytochemistry. They load their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Those are secondary metabolic compounds that make the leaves inedible. Um, t- except for the insects that have evolved adaptations to get around those defenses. So that's what a, a close coevolutionary relationship with a, a plant brings to an insect over evolutionary time. And you're talking about many, many generations. Um, so, for example, the monarch butterfly is a specialist on milkweeds. Well, the monarch lineage around the world has been associated with milkweeds for millions of years. This is not a sudden adaptation. And that is true for, for most of the, the specialized relationships that are out there. Um, and again, 90% of our insect herbivores are host plant specialists. So when we bring plants from China or, or South America or wherever to our gardens, um, only a very few insects are able to use them and that's typically because they already have the adaptations necessary because they, uh, the plants they evolved with are sharing common chemicals to these new plants that we brought in. So what we do, we create a, a, a very depauperate insect community associated with these gardens. Now, this is confusing to a lot of people because most people only see the insects that are going to flowers. And they say, oh, there's plenty of insects on my flowers. Well, most of those are generalist pollinators. Uh, they're not eating the leaves, so they're not exposed to the the defensive phytochemistry I'm talking about. Uh, but but most pollinators are not important parts of, of uh, the food web. It's caterpillars that are driving the food web. They're transferring more energy from plants to any other to up the up the, the food web to higher trophic levels than any other type of animal. If you remove caterpillars from an ecosystem, you have um, serious declines in those other animals, particularly birds. In North America, 96% of our birds are breeding, rearing their young on insects, and we have found most of those insects are caterpillars. We, we've uh, looked at, at the what dominates nestling diets in, six, in 20 families of birds in North America, and 16 of the 20 families, it's dominated by caterpillars. So when we design gardens and landscapes that don't make caterpillars, and that's easy to do, you lose all those birds. 
one important thing we need to focus on is how different plants are, even native plants, in their ability to make caterpillars. So, for example, um, I'm sure this is true in, in Europe, but it's certainly true here in, in North America. Um, Zenus Quercus oaks are, are number one in their ability to make caterpillars. I live in the mid-Atlantic states of North America, and just in our, our few states, there are 557 species of caterpillars that develop on oaks. Compared to other native plants like, like tulip trees, it's a good native. There's only 21 that can develop on tulip trees. Um, and then you look at these, in, these non-native species, whether they're invasive or not, things like ginkgo or crepe myrtle or many of our favorite ornamentals, most of them support zero, no caterpillars at all. So there's a fantastic variation in the ability to produce the animals that drive our food web with plant choice. And that's why plant choice in our gardens is so important. Hmm. Well, talking of caterpillars, in the UK, some landscape architects and designers, and particularly those that are involved in public planting, would argue that our native trees are disease prone and therefore non-natives provide us with more versatile and healthier alternatives. Do you face that argument in the US? Uh, Absolutely. But remember, Landscape designers, landscape architects, most gardeners in general are gardening for aesthetics. They want plants that nothing can touch. They call them pest-free. So you have a, a, a beautiful landscape that nothing can use, which is a dead zone. And that is the crux of the problem. We're loading our landscapes with plants that do not pass the energy they harness from the sun to anything else. And when you do that in a few places, it's okay. But when you do it everywhere... It's not okay, because that is the collapse of the food webs that support our our, uh, our birds. I mean, look at in the UK, the the uh, the house sparrow is in serious decline. When you lose the house sparrow, then, then there's there's a real issue. Um, so so designing landscapes that actually support other life forms is is a critical part of our future. We there's just too many of us everywhere to design these dead zones, even though they're beautiful. Mm. Yeah, and your book details a system whereby we can make relatively easy changes to bring maximum benefits to wildlife. And it's based on research that's been conducted in the US. And I do have quite a a number of US listeners to the podcast. But are you aware of any other similar types of research that are being carried out in other countries? There's a fair amount in Australia. A guy last name Samways uh, has, has done a fair amount of it. There have been a number of reviews recently, well, within the last decade, of what the impact of non-native plants has been uh, in Europe, in Australia, in North America, not so much in, in South America. Um, and every every one of these reviews reviewing, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of studies concludes that there's a serious depression of insect populations when native plants are replaced by, by non-native plants. Um, uh, it's not always the case. There's there are a few exceptions, but uh, the the um, the average response is uh, a serious decline in, in insects. So so it's a it's a phenomenon that has been studied around the around the world. And of course, the 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 theoretical advances way back in the the uh, 70s and 80s that pointed out how important insect plant interactions where how the the specialized relationships between insects and plants coevolution and all of that um, they predicted this you know decades ago so so theoretically none of this is new none of it's surprising uh, but what they didn't know back then was the extent to which non-native plants were replacing native plants and what that might do to um, ecosystem function and and the biodiversity crisis that's the part that that uh, we're we're focusing on now uh, but but as you said earlier, the good news is it's relatively easy to turn this around. Unless you've actually lost the species to extinction, uh, if you put what it needs back in the landscape, insects are really good at recolonizing the plants they need. I've demonstrated that here at home a number of times by putting in a plant. I don't even know where the original in- insect population comes from, but uh, within sometimes months, but often a few years, they find these plants and I've got a, a healthy population. So if we put the host plants that support our insect diversity and abundance back into our landscapes, um, 
we can rebuild viable food webs, which will recharge our, our the ability of, of birds to breed uh, and many other parts of the food web. Mm-hmm. And do you think if we could wave a wand tomorrow and and plant native plants uh, that would benefit invertebrates, which would then benefit birds, would that solve the problem or do we need to concentrate on other things, um, you know, kind of habitat loss in, in other ways? Are there other problems that we're facing too? Well, you know, this gets back to carrying capacity uh, and it gets back to the human footprint. Every time we build a building, <laughs> that space is no longer useful for for habitat on any level. Uh, and we keep expanding our our uh, our urban footprint, our suburban footprint, the number of, you know, the, the infrastructure, all the paved roads, you know, we're paving over the planet. We're, we're cutting down the, the tropical rainforest. I just read today that, that the, the loss of, of tropical rainforest has accelerated again. Um, so, so putting native plants back where we humans are will help all of that, but it's not going to, it's not going to replace the importance of these, these natural areas that we keep paving over so so it's a piece of the conservation puzzle it's not the entire puzzle i wondered when i was reading your new book whether your message had developed or changed since your previous books you know the urgency uh has increased when i wrote uh, bringing nature home we had not done a lot of the research trying to put numbers behind the predictions at that point but in the last 15 years, we have done a lot of that, and other people have done it too. So I now have um, have data to support much of what I said in, in bringing nature home. Um, and and again, the the uh, global headlines are creating an urgency that uh, propels the message. The general public now is hearing it not just from me anymore. That's good. It's hearing they're hearing it from from um, you know major headlines of, of uh, all the major media outlets. Uh, and they're concerned about it. This this has surprised me. When when the headline about the the you know global insect decline hit, I didn't think anybody would care about that. But I immediately got insect or, or uh, emails from people from all over the country saying, "Oh, is this true? What can we do? What can we do?" So that's good news. People want to do something. Um, and there's some things they can do that are very easy. Have nothing to do with plants. How about light pollution at night? Turn your lights out at night. Or put a motion sensor on your light so it only turns on when the bad man comes. Or if you don't want to do that, put a yellow bulb in your night lights because that's less attractive to insects. Or a yellow LED bulb is particularly unattractive. But we lose billions of insects all over the country, all over the world, every night because we've got lights on. And most of the time, we don't even know why we have those lights on. It's just a habit. So there are things that the average homeowner um, can do almost everywhere that will help uh, insect declines. Mm. Yeah, turning lights off is a great one. Is there anything else that people can do in order to keep us moving in the right direction? And I'm thinking also specifically about, is there any kind of key research that needs to be done, in your opinion, to move us forward? You know, we we already know much of what we need to know. Um, one of the one of the biggest uh, step forwards I think uh, that we've come up with recently is the recognition of how different native plants are um, within you know among native plants, but what I'm calling keystone genera, keystone plants, where about five percent of the native plants are producing about seventy five percent of the food. That's a really important piece of information uh, because that means. You've got to. You, they have to be the backbone of any landscape. Those those keystone plants, and then you can diversify with with other plants. Um, so learning that has been a big step forward. Another thing is that there is room for compromise here. Uh, but one of my students finished uh, some research recently showing that if you have seventy percent of the plant biomass in your landscape native, thirty percent can be non-native, and you still can have viable food webs. And particularly if the 70% are those, those keystone plants. Um, so that's great because it's, you know, it shows there's, there's room for compromise. If my message truly was you can have no non-native plants, I'd have very few listeners. People would say, I, I don't care if the rest of, of the biodiversity collapses. I want my pretty plants. But you can still have your pretty plants as long as they're not dominating the landscape. So to me, that's, that's good news. But how how these keystone plants interact with light pollution is an important piece of research that needs to be ironed out. Uh, 
Um, we've got preliminary evidence now that you can use keystone plants. You can have your oak trees. They bring in lots of, of uh, moths to, to make those caterpillars, but then they all get killed at light. So, uh, it, you know, you're having part of the solution, but not all, all the solution. And, and um, another, another key thing we need to understand is um, how much plant material do you need to have a viable food, food web? You know, is one flower in a pot going to do it? Or, or it's obvious that the more, the better. But what what is the minimum amount when you can actually have a self-replicating food web? Uh, and nobody's looked at that on, on any level. So always room for, for new research. But um, we are way past the point where we need to wait for new research. New research will guide us, uh, but we need to start acting right away. And one of the first things that, at least in this country, that the, the typical homeowner can do is reduce the area that's in lawn. You know, turf grass doesn't do any of the things we need, we need to do in our landscapes. I would talk about four major things every, every landscape has to do. One is support that viable food web we've been talking about. Another is, is sequester carbon. You know, it's plants that are pulling carbon out of the air and putting it in their tissues and then pumping it into the ground. Um, and, and, uh, it is the easiest way for the for the individual to address climate change issues is by just putting more plants into their landscape. Another one is managing watershed. Everybody lives in a watershed, and it's plants that manage that watershed. And again, all the times we take plants out of our landscapes and replace them either with pavement or lawn, we're wrecking the watershed. And then the final thing every every landscape has to do is support uh, a viable pollinator community. And it's not for agriculture. You hear all the time, oh, they pollinate a third of our crops, so we need pollinators. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we would lose 80 to 90% of the plants, and that is not an option. And we need those pollinators everywhere, not just in parks and preserves, but everywhere, including our yards, including our cities, everywhere that we want plants, which is everywhere. Um, so how do we accomplish those four goals on, on your average landscape? That's more research that needs to be done. I must just ask you one last question, which I may slot in earlier. One of the arguments that I counter, I, f- I find people using to counter using native plants in this country, in the UK, is that they say we don't have the variety of species that you have in the US. So they say our native flora isn't as pretty as yours. What would you say to that? Is there an argument against that? Well, it's true. <laughs> You're an island, <laughs> I thought it was and, just and you don't have. Yeah, you don't have as many species. Um, but again, you you said the key word there. So our landscapes aren't as pretty. Um, and if your only goal is to is to design for aesthetics, then you're right. You bring in plants from all over the the world. But but there's a huge downside to that. We need to de- design beautiful landscapes that are functional. So take advantage of those those um, that thirty percent that we of non natives we can use ornamentally as accents, um, but we you you have to start. It's like building a building without the supports. You can't build a building out of wallpaper. You have to have those two by fours, and you've got to have the supports up, and then you can decorate it. And that's what we've been missing. We've been missing those those keystone native plants to to support the life around us. I mean, you've got the wonderful English uh, Quercus robar, the English oak over there. You need to get as many of those back into the landscape as possible. Most environmental issues are huge, and the individual feels helpless. You know, climate change, I mean, oh, what can I do as an individual? And, you know, I understand that. There's nothing you can do where you see a change tomorrow, but not this issue. You can put those plants in your yard and see that change tomorrow. You can see things come and start to use those plants. You can see life return to your little piece of the earth um, almost immediately. That's positive feedback. You as an individual, whether you own land or whether you're going to volunteer in a, on a, a park or a preserve, are, are part of the, the, um, the conservation puzzle of the future. You're one piece of it, but that puzzle won't be complete if you leave that piece out. So, so it's a very important piece, and, and you, can, you can do your part don't think of the of the Earth's problems 
you know, you're not challenged. You're not trying to address the earth problems yourself. Just worry about the little piece of the earth that you own or can, can influence. If you get rid of the invasive species, cut the lawn in half, put in, put in pollinator plants and, and use those keystone plants. You've done everything you can do and you can feel good about it. A really big thank you to Doug for taking part in the interview. If you're interested in wildlife gardening, his books are essential reading, so do go and seek them out. Thanks to you for listening too. The episode will finish with Bug of the Week with Dr Ian Bedford, and Ian is talking about something you may have noticed in the past week or two popping up in your aromatics, the rosemary leaf beetle. As Ian mentioned, some gardeners like me get a kick out of seeing these beautiful beetles and are happy to leave them be, but he offers a tip if they're causing a real problem. Appearing in many gardens across the UK is an invasive yet very attractive ladybird-sized beetle called the rosemary leaf beetle. The adults are coloured with beautiful metallic green and purple stripes, whilst their grub-like larvae are dull white with dark grey stripes along their sides. As their name suggests, their primary host plant is rosemary, but they can also be found on other plants that produce high levels of camphor, such as lavender, sage and thyme. The rosemary leaf beetle first appeared in the UK in the mid-90s and soon became established within central London before spreading out across the UK, where they can now be found feeding on their host plants throughout the year, only leaving to hide underground during the coldest of days. Some people might actually enjoy seeing the rosemary leaf beetles in their gardens and admire the beauty of these living jewelled adornments on their plants. However, they can become a serious pest for commercial lavender and herb growers, where heavy infestations can soon develop if left untreated causing damage to the plant's growing points and ultimately leading to dieback. In a home garden, though, an infestation can be kept under control or eradicated relatively simply and doesn't need to involve spraying pesticides that will also kill the many beneficial insects that visit the flowers of these aromatic host plants. Simply by laying an old sheet around the base of an infested plant, then vigorously shaking the shoots and branches, the beetles and their grubs will tumble out on top of the sheet where they can be collected by hand and safely removed. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.